complex numbers. I used to have the math anxiety that a lot of you have, especially when you take tests, right? It's an anxious time. But uh, part of that anxiety is caused by the jargon. So don't let the complex in the complex numbers scare you. The goal is to simply add, subtract, multiply, and divide complex numbers. The four operations, right? Yeah, that's familiar territory. Okay, let's start off with a question. Here's the question. Is there a solution to the equation x squared plus one equals zero? In other words, is there a number x you can square, add one to it, and get zero? Well, well, if you think, if you use the techniques that we've developed for solving this equation, you'd have to isolate the x squared. What would you get on the right side? Negative one. Negative one. So that's, it's equivalent to asking, is there a number I can square and get negative one? There's no real number I can do that with, right? No, zero squared is zero. <laughs> zero times zero is zero. One times one is one. Negative one squared is positive one, right? Everybody, everybody see what I'm saying? There's no real number you can square and get negative one. So the answer to the question, you might think it's no, but I'll say it this way, not unless we make one up. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to make one up. And you might think, well, now he's great. Now the teacher is making up math. What good is that? Well, it, it actually does a lot of good. Uh, these kind of numbers we're talking about today are used all the time in engineering, particularly electrical engineering. Um, we're not going to get into those applications, thankfully. For, uh, most of you probably are thinking. Uh, but, yeah, anytime you analyze AC circuits, this number I'm about to show you is going to pop up. It's called J in uh, electronics but uh, or in electrical engineering, but we're going to call it I. So here's the definition. I, you could do it two ways. You could say I squared is negative one. So that, that's the made up, I then is the made up solution to that equation, right? You plug I in for X, you get uh, a solution to that equation. But more specifically, we're going to say I is the the, po the positive or principal square root of negative one. So that's usually the way we think about it. Now, unfortunately, I is called the imaginary unit. Now, why is that unfortunate? Well, because imaginary kind of makes you think that it's not good for anything, right? But the imaginary number i is, is good for a lot of things, not the least of which is what I just mentioned, AC circuits. So it's just one of those things. It was called imaginary, but there's, it, it has a lot of uses in math. So, so by the way then, just taking that equation, x squared plus 1 equals 0 then, the solution, it actually has two solutions. i and really negative i, right? So if you put i in here and in, in for x and square it, then i squared by definition is negative 1, and, and negative 1 plus uh, 1 is, is equal to 0. So that's one of the solutions. And, and same thing if you plug in negative i, because the negative squares out, the, the initial negative squares out anyway. So there you go, now well, we made up a solution. I is not like any number you've ever seen before. It only has four unique powers. So let's think about this. Everybody would agree that I is hopefully equal to itself, right? Any number is equal to itself. I squared, as we've already defined, is equal to negative one, right? Okay, what would I cubed be then? I mean, it's I cubed, right? But it simplifies. Because I, if, if the powers, uh, if, the, if the laws of exponents hold, then I cubed means I squared times I, doesn't it? By, just by definition of, of what an exponent means. But what is I squared? I squared is negative 1. So negative 1 times I would just be called negative I. So I cubed is equal to negative I. That doesn't happen when you, when you cube 2, right? 
Two cubed is not negative two. Two cubed is eight. So this is a weird number. It should strike you as strange. This is not, an, this is not a number you would count apples with, is it? No. You don't have negative I apples or I apples. But then again, you don't count apples with negative numbers either, right? Didn't negative numbers seem really strange the first time you saw them? Yeah, they did to me. I didn't like them at all. But, they, but you can't deny their usefulness, right? If you have negative $500 in your bank account, that tells you something, right? You're overdrawn by 500 bucks. So, so negative numbers are useful, even though they're not useful for counting apples or objects. And it does turn out that, that I is useful, but it's not useful for counting just objects. Okay, I to the fourth, how could you break up I to the fourth? Well, that would be I squared times I squared would be one way to write it, right? But what is I squared equal to? Negative one, so what's negative one times negative one? One. So you start off with I to the first power, you get, I, I didn't write it that way, but I to the first power is I, right? And you go to I to the fourth, you get one. What's gonna happen then if you go to the I to the fifth? Well, one way to write that would be I to the fourth times I, right? But what's I to the fourth? One. So one times I should hopefully be I. So look, we've gone all the way around. We've, we started out with I, we started taking successive powers and we got to I to the fifth and we're back to I again. So what that really means is there's only four unique powers of I. We're gonna assume that I to the zero, by the way, is equal to just one. Case case you're interested in, in knowing that. But that's the same as I to the fourth, right? I to the fourth is equal to one. So there are only four unique powers of I. So that should strike you as weird. So that means if I have like I to the 92 power, that should reduce to one of the four powers of I. Right? Now, how, how, what would be a simple way to, to reduce that? Well, if you think about it, if you took this, uh, this five on the I and you divided it by four, four comes from the fact that there are only four unique powers of I, and you look at the remainder, that's gonna be the reduced power of I. So four goes into five, how many times without going over? One, right? Do the long division you get a remainder of one. But that's exactly what the reduced power on the I was. That's what's left over when you, when you take out those, those uh, extra, extra factors that are equal to one, essentially. So what does that mean? Well, that means we can reduce any power of I. So simplify I to the 42 power, basically, you need to take 42, divide by four, and the remainder is gonna be the reduced power on the i, that i to the 42 reduces to. So uh, how many times is four going to 42 without going over? 10 times, okay, four times 10 is what? 40, what's the remainder? Two, that's the reduced power on the i. So I to the 42 is exactly what you just said. I to the 42 is I squared, but what's I squared? Negative one. negative one. So believe it or not, I to the 42nd power is just negative one, the number negative one. Pretty trippy, huh? Okay, let's try I to the 91. Well, you guys try it. Take 91, divide by four, tell me what the remainder is. Well, okay, take four into, ni into nine goes how many times without going over? Twice, so start there. Bring down the one. What's the remainder gonna be? Three. So I to the 91 is really equal to I cubed, but wait a minute, I cubed reduces. What was I cubed equal to? negative i. So believe it or not, i to the 91 is equal to negative i. 
Okay, so you need to know those four powers of I, right? The four unique powers of I that we listed here. I, the one, of course, is I. I squared is negative one. That's the most important one. I cubed is negative I, and of course, I to the fourth, you're back to one. So the big rule here, the big rule here, I didn't finish it. Okay, for A greater than zero, so the, the assumption is A is a real number, like you could locate it on the number line. You can't locate imaginary numbers on, on the number line that you're used to. The big rule is this, for A greater than zero, a real number A greater than zero, the square root of negative a is i times the square root of a. That's the big rule. So where does this come from? Well, think about it this way, and it might make sense to you. You could think of the square root of negative a as the square root of negative 1 times a, right? And then if that property holds that you can break up the radical over multiplication, don't you get the square root of negative one times the square root of a? But what's the square root of negative one? i. So that's all we're saying, okay? We're saying the square root of negative a is equal to i times the square root of a. In other words, you, you poke the i out. Poke the eye out. It's all fun and games until you poke it, until someone pokes an eye out. Poke the eye out. So the square root of negative four, you always poke the eye out first, you guys. So if you use that property above, how could you rewrite the square root of negative four? You could rewrite it as i times root four. But wait a minute, you know how to take the square root of four. What's the square root of four? Two, so you could say i times two is the answer, but most people write two times i. You don't even need the multiplication symbol, just two i. And, and by the way, you don't need to show this work. You don't need to show it in this case. So just go right to the answer. Square root of negative four is two i. So if you were explaining this to a friend, you would just say, hey, take the square root of four as usual, and then s slap on an extra factor of i, right? If you want to take the square root of negative eight, just simplify the square root of eight as usual, and then remember, on the outside of the radical, that's very important, you put out an extra factor of i. You multiply by i. Now, just to show you why that works, okay, square root of negative eight according to that big property would be, in terms of i, i times square root eight. Oh, but you know how to simplify the square root of eight. The square root of eight, what's the biggest perfect square that's a factor of eight? Four, so two squared, right? Two squared times two. You could write it as four times two, that's fine. And then once you take out the, you can break up the radical over multiplication, take out the square root of two squared, which is two, and I would pull the i out in front like that. So you get two i rad two. That is your answer. So again, you simplify as the, the root as usual if you're asked to simplify. And then remember, put on, uh, on the outside uh, of the radical, put on an extra factor of i. So that's not actually, doesn't seem that new now, does it? It's just kind of one extra step. Okay, we haven't talked about complex numbers yet. What is a complex number? A complex number is a mixture of a real number Again, when you think of real numbers, think of the number line that you're used to graphing a single number on. You can locate any point on the number line, fraction, whole number, the opposite of any whole numbers, decimals. Well, a complex number is, is a combination of a real number and an imaginary number. So any number of the form A plus BI, where A and B are reals, a and B are, whoops, A and B. A and B are real numbers. Any number that looks like this, A plus BI, any number of this form is called a complex number. So let me give you uh, some examples. 
um, 2 plus 3i. We think of that as one object, one quantity that is a complex number, okay? 2 plus 3i, what's a? 2, what's b? A lot of books would call a uh, the real part. And B the imaginary part, not, and it, it differs from books to book, from book to book. Some books call B times I the imaginary part. Some books just call the the number in front of the I, the imaginary part. I believe, if I remember right, your book would just call the three in this case the imaginary part. But you need to just be able to identify them as A and B, and that's that's good enough. How about? Um, same thing, uh, same idea. What if we had 3.1 minus pi times i? Pi, the usual 3.14159, blah, blah, blah. That's a complex number. What is a? 3.1, what is b? Well, you'd have to include the negative, right? Just like you do with coefficients in polynomials. So negative pi. Don't round off, just negative pi. What if uh, I gave you the number 10? First of all, is the number 10 a complex number? So, that, so the real question then is, is a real number a complex number? Well, what if I did this? 10 plus zero, well wait, let me put an equal sign. 10 plus zero times i. And, I mean, we're going to have to assume that 0 times i is 0, just like any other multiplication, but we'll just say, hey, that's true, and, and say that's a definition, and don't worry about it. Then, then is it true? Yeah, 10 is a real number, but it's also a complex number. So a in this case is what? 10 and b is 0. So true, this would be an excellent question on, on the next test. True or, or false, every real number is a complex number. So think of a real number like just in generically A. True or false, A, it's a real number, but is it also a complex number? Yeah, it's true because couldn't I do that trick I just did with the 10 with the A, A plus zero I, couldn't I write A as being equal to A plus zero I? Yeah. Every real number is complex. Does it work the other way around? Every complex number is a real number? No, no. The, the first two examples of complex numbers uh, would not be uh, 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 real numbers. So two plus three I, no. It has one, think of it this way. It has one foot in the real numbers, the number two. It has another foot in the imaginary numbers, uh, three, three I. So that would be false, that would be false. So that means the set of complex numbers contains the real numbers. Uh, remember the, what the real goal was today. The real goal was to add, subtract, multiply, and divide complex numbers. But you know what? Once you understand what complex numbers are and what i is, the, the four operations are no big deal because we perform them the way you think we would. So let's start with addition. Compute, in part a, let's take uh, the complex number four minus three i, and add it to the complex number negative two minus five i. If you were inventing addition of complex numbers, which somebody did just a, a couple hundred years ago really, how would you want to add these together? You would want to add probably the real part and the imaginary parts. Just like like terms, thinking of them as like terms, right? Thinking of the, the real part as like terms, constants, and the imaginary part as like terms, even though it's, it don't think of i like x though, because i is an, an actual specific number, whereas x represents usually a variable. Okay, so if you do that, what do you get? Four plus a, a negative two, two, negative three i minus five i, minus eight i. Is it really that easy? Yes, it's really that easy. I feel like I'm selling you a food processor for only 19.99. Complex numbers. It grinds up, adds them together. Two minus eight, so that's about, I mean, it, isn't that about how you'd want it to work if you were inventing the addition? Yeah, what else are you gonna do? Well, is subtraction gonna be much different? So 
In part B, we're taking negative 2 plus 4i minus uh, the entire complex number, negative 5 plus 7i. So we need parentheses around it because we're thinking of negative 5 plus 7i as one number. In the last example, the parentheses weren't necessary. In this example, the second set around the negative 5 plus 7i, they are necessary because what do you think you have to remember to do? Distribution. Distribution property, yeah. So I can just drop the front set of parentheses, 2 plus, uh, negative 2 plus 4i, but then distribute them minus, what do you get? plus 5, minus 7i. You've turned it into an addition problem, right? Essentially, and when you, when you subtract 7i, it's, it's adding a negative 7i, right? So add the real parts, what do you get? Negative 2 plus 5, 3. Add the imaginary parts, 4i plus a negative 7i, or just 4 minus 7i? Minus 3i, yep. So 3 minus 3i? It's really not new, is it? The, I mean, the symbolism isn't new, and how we work with the symbolism. It, the, the numbers are new ideas, but the actual way we treat them isn't. Yeah? Um, so you wouldn't go any further than that? You can't. You can't go any further than that. There's nothing else to do. It would, it would, it would be like uh, adding, you can't add or subtract unlike terms, right? So there's nothing else to do. Oh. Okay. Now, uh, multiplication, I have several multiplications for you, uh, uh, to show you. Uh, in this case, we're multiplying two purely imaginary numbers, the square root of negative 2 times the square root of negative 10. I can think of two ways to do this, but there's only one way that, that's going to make sense with our physical applications that we have uh, that you're not going to see in this class, but you might if you, if you go get into physics or engineering. Um, and the only way that makes sense is to poke the eyes out first, okay? It's the only way that actually works with with what we, and does what we want it to. So before you do anything else, so in other words, I don't want you using the real number property that when you take the square root of A times the square root of B, you get uh, the uh, big square root of A times B. In fact, that doesn't work when uh, A or B is less than zero. That property actually doesn't hold, so I'll put a not equal to when a and b are less than zero. So poke the i's out first, what do you get? i times root 2 times i times root 10. Now reorder the multiplication in the middle. You can make it i times i, whoops, let me write it as i times i, and then square root of 2 times square root of, t of 10. Now when A and B, the guys underneath the radicals are bigger than 0, you can go ahead and combine into one big radical, can't you? So you could make the square root of 2 times the square root of 10 the square root of 20. What is I times I? I squared. I squared. So I squared is negative 1, and also we should simplify root 20. So 20 is 4 times 5, right? So you can pull out a square root of 4 or 2. So this is going to simplify to be negative 1 times the square root of 4 times 5, but you can pull out a factor of 2, square root of 4. What's negative 1 times the square root of 4? It's negative 2. So you get negative 2 root 5 is your answer. Part D, we're taking a real number, 3, and multiplying times a, a, a complex number, a true complex number, 5 minus 12i. So what do you think we have to do with that 3 here? Distribute, distribute the 3. The distribution property works for complex numbers, just like it works for every other number, every other set of numbers you've looked at. Uh, OK, so multiply out the 3, what do you get? Fifteen minus thirty-six i. Three times five, distribute it. Uh, three uh, times the five, and then distribute the three over the minus twelve i. Three times twelve i is thirty-six i. So fifteen minus thirty-six i. Let me show you how to multiply two complex numbers together. If you had to guess, what would you do? You would do good old FOIL, right? Yeah, and FOIL really is just distribution, right? So we're going to distribute. Uh, every, every 
individual term in the first uh, factor times every term in the second factor. But if you want to, think of it as FOIL. Multiply the first together, what do you get? Three. Multiply the outer together, what do you get? Keep the operation, so plus 5i. Multiply the inner together, what do you get? Minus 9i. Minus Finally, multiply the last together. Minus, oh careful, minus 3i distributed over a plus 5i. So minus 15i squared. And then the trick is you have to remember i squared is negative 1. So, okay, like terms in the middle, what's 5i minus 9i? Whoops. Let's, let's make it a minus there. So minus 4i in the middle, and then minus 15 times negative 1. Right? Did everybody see what I did? I replaced the i squared with negative 1. And so you get 3 minus 4i plus 15. You see any like terms there? So 18 minus 4i. Now we have negative 5i divided by 1 plus i. Okay, believe it or not, you already know how to do this. What is i? It's the square root of negative 1, right? How do you get rid of a square root in the denominator when you have a sum or difference? No, you can't square it. You multiply numerator and denominator by the conjugate. The conjugate. You pay a conjugate visit, right? So uh, what's the conjugate of 1 plus i? 1 minus i. You multiply the numerator and denominator to do the division. In other words, to get rid of the i in the denominator, you multiply numerator and denominator by 1 minus i, if it's a sum or difference. So let's do the denominator first. When you multiply conjugates, you don't actually have to do the full FOIL, right? Because the outer and inner terms cancel. So you multiply the first together, you get 1. But if you do the outer, and the inner, they knock each other out because the outer gives you minus i, the inner gives you plus i. If you add those together, they're gone. So all you really have to do is multiply the first terms together. What's 1 times 1? One. 1. Outer and inner knock each other out, so then just do the last terms together. What's that? Minus i squared, and that's your denominator, but we need to simplify it. Well, okay, let's go ahead and, and uh, multiply out the numerator as well. So just distribute up top. What's negative 5i times 1? Negative 5i, right? Multiply by 1, you just get the number back again. And then distribute the negative 5i over minus i. Is it minus? Plus, Plus 5i squared. What do you have to do with the i squareds? replace them with negative 1 because that's what i squared is equal to. So you get negative 5i plus 5 times negative 1 up top. On the bottom you get 1 minus negative 1. Notice how I put the negative 1 in parentheses. Okay, so what do you get? Negative 5i minus 5 over 2. Negative 5i minus 5 all over 2. One pl uh, plus one, right? Now that's a great way to write it. This is the same thing. Uh, if you turn it around, you get negative five halves, and then you'd have minus the um, five halves i on the end there if you turn it around. And that's, that's equivalent, right? If you undo the subtraction and keep the common denominator there. Does everybody see that? So in part G, you guys, let's take 5 minus i divide by negative i. 5 minus i divided by negative i. Okay, what would the trick be here? Yeah, what's the conjugate of negative i? I. And by the way, if there's a number in front there, you can ignore the number, the, the, the real number, the, the, fa the real number factor, that is. So yeah, you could, you, you could think of 0 minus i. You could think of negative i as 0 minus i. And it is, in this, you, could, you don't have to think of it in terms of the conjugate, but it's, it just, it's helpful for getting rid of the negative in the denominator if you do. So what's the conjugate of 0 minus i? Zero. 0 plus i, which is just i. 
So the idea would be to multiply numerator and denominator by i in this case. If you multiplied by negative i, that would work too. That would still get rid of the i in the denominator. You just have some simplifying to do with the negative in the denominator. So, okay, so you multiply straight across. I actually usually say do the denominator first. So in the denominator, what's negative i times i? That's negative i squared, right? What is that going to turn out to be? Well, it's the opposite of negative 1, isn't it? It's the opposite of negative 1, so it's actually just, oh, 1. Okay, and then after you do that, go ahead and distribute in the numerator. What do you get? 5i minus i squared. 5i minus i squared, okay. So do I need to show division by 1? Now, so let's just take the numerator, 5i minus i squared, but what is i squared? Negative 1. Negative one. Five. So it's 5i plus 1. Most books will tell you to write it in a plus bi form, which in this case just means turn it around. Turn it around, you can get 1 plus 5i as your answer.